Good morning, friends. Uh, um, let's uh, start the lecture, uh, the 18th lecture of law and economics. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the criminal intent and punishment, which is a continuation of what we have uh, done in the earlier lecture on criminal law, that is the introductory portion, where we have seen uh, different uh, uh, context of uh, introduction of criminal law and rationalization of criminal law. Now uh, what we are going to study uh, or discuss in this uh, particular session is that uh, we are going to talk about why uh, this crime takes place or uh, the most important part of the crime is actually the intention or mens rea. So, uh, this is basically what we are going to talk, uh, analyze here and how we basically uh, uh, deal with such an intention or uh, such a guilty mind. So, this is what is the second part which is called the punishment part. So, there are different kinds of punishment as well as uh, different reason as intention being taught under the uh, criminal law premise and uh, we let's uh, discuss one by one. So we have been focusing on optimal enforcement so far that is how much should we invest in catch catching criminals. Uh, uh, we have already seen that there is a uh, case of enforcement if the proximity of you being get caught then uh, the probability of uh, crime or the crime itself is very very minimal. So that is comes with a very huge cost except uh, the geographical advantage which we discussed in the last lecture. Uh, the other possibilities are a little very hard to find. Otherwise it has to be very close knitted community where crimes within that community would be minimal. Alright so these are the kind of things uh, uh, which is very uh, very crucial as far as this particular point is concerned and how should uh, we punish them when we catch and after we are catching the level of punishment is also important because many place uh, crime uh, the crimes have been treated with a severe punishment uh, sometimes the severity is uh, worse so under such circumstance also the probability of punishment is less Sorry, the probability of a crime is less. Uh, so now uh, this is actually comes with these two questions: how much we have to invest on this uh, catching the person, as well as how much we uh, how punish the person once we. So very little on determining guilt or innocence and both of this thing is actually nothing to do with whether the person is criminal or not. So we assume that uh, they are criminals but uh, otherwise there is uh, I mean catching a person and uh, punishing the person is nothing to do with whether the person has done really the case of uh, crime or not. Uh, we assume that if they have done what we have, what we have to do. So uh, now what we have to do is actually get the fact, decide how likely it is they committed to uh, committed the crime, and based on relative cost of uh, freeing the guilty and punishing the innocent, there is some amount of certainty about which we punish. So uh, this is what is we have done, and uh, that. Uh, uh, leads the, the analysis is in fact uh, uh, focus on the motivation in that sense. So Peter Lisson has studied a case, I mean uh, the a portion of the law and economics, which, uh, a criminal law which is called the ODLs and this is appeared in the general law and economics. Uh, uh, he talked about ODLs alright, so ODL First in a series of paper on the law and economics of superstition. For him, he, he had gone through for 400 years the most sophisticated person in Europe decide difficult 
criminal cases by asking the defendant to thrust his arm into a cauldron of boiled water and fish out of a ring so if his arm was unharmed he was exonerated so this is if not he was convicted so these are the kind of uh, thing which normally uh, applied in the europe uh, in europe for quite a long time like 400 years or so so alternatively a priest dangan the defendant in a pool sinking through his innocence floating through his guilty now people call these trials ordeals so this is what he was actually looked into this kind of uh, things was been discussed and uh, found out interesting results no one alive today believe ordeals were a good way to decide defendants guilt but maybe they should because uh, ordeals were very very prevalently used in that point like at least 400 years of a stretch okay in the Euro- in in the european um, countries ordeals were only used when there was uncertainty about guilt or innocence and this is even uh, the case with uh, the kingship and uh, the rules in the uh, rules based on faith etc so this is there is nothing surprising that this is actually never been used it is there is a lot of uh such uh kind of punishment system where been uh existed at, uh, in the historical time period so there are so many examples which we can come up with the ordeals existence for example the hot water ordeal hot iron ordeal cold water ordeal etc so lesen's point that that ordeal may have actually done a pretty good job of ascertaining guilt or innocence so why should ordeal work so solve guilt or innocence you just seem d that is medieval belief that the god would help the innocent survive the ordeal but not the guilt this is actually inbuilt in most of our history for example in the abrahamic religious thinking that is which was prevalent in the, all across europe and in asia and other parts of the world like uh, this jewish tradition or christian tradition or islamic tradition or what other traditions and all so these are uh, based on belief system right so once it is based on belief system they have stories to talk about the very existence of the belief for example uh, the story which we had uh, heard in different hebraic that is in the in the semitic religions is abraham was thrown to a fire bowl and he survived all right because he is actually the son of god uh, he is a whatever prophet and god helped him to survive these are kind of you know uh, sort of uh, uh, belief people are believing in and the stories are actually very much rooted in people's mind same the cases in the ramayana what are the end of the ramayana what uh, uh, raman has done or he asked sita to walk through the fire right uh, for proving her uh, you know purity or chastity or whatever so this is a kind of ordeal again this is also if she is actually guilty or she seem pure she may be burned otherwise she is you know innocent so this kind of things is always there and it has been practiced in all epical uh, epic and the religious you know part and parcel of uh, religious belief etc so in that context this ordeal is not a new thing or it is uh, it is something to be uh, you know surprised of but it was used 
and uh, now we believe that no this uh, system is complete nonsense all right so in that context uh, there are certain written uh, or recorded uh, cases of ordeal uh, these recorded ordeals were studied by lesen and now we are analyzing that okay so if people believe uh, this then guilty won't want to go through the ordeal will instead confess so this is the kind so if you know that you are guilty and you are going to have this and you are also a believer then uh, there is a logic that you know you won't go through the ordeal instead of that what you do is actually you confess so confessing leads to a lesser punishment than failing the ordeal plus you don't burn your hands or whatever you don't lo lose your limb so the innocent uh, agrees to go through the ordeal expecting to be saved by the miracle so administering priest knows if someone agrees to take the ordeal he is innocent and risks the ordeal so he will pass so this is what is we think or at the end of the the ordeal has so in that sense ordeal is basically used as an effective tool in a different uh, uh, socio political system so or belief system basically in the social uh, than the system which we are right now here also it is uh, now uh, possible but uh, the probability is very uh, less so we'll see that obviously people have to believe that god will separate so god will spare the innocent judge the guilty so this is the fundamental uh, structure of this thing so you have to believe a ceremony reinforces by linking the belief to the other religious belief priest might have to let someone fail an ordeal once in a while to keep people believing in the system so again this was only done in case where normal evidence was lacking so unlikely to be contradicted now this was always been used for example in you know, uh you may be burned alive you may be actually you know crucified you may be uh you know uh, there are so many ways. if you are actually not guilty then you will you not know, die or something like that so, so that is called the harsher punishment the lighter punishments are actually putting your hands in a boil oil boiling oil oil or walking through the fire etc okay and priest must have a way to rig the ordeal so lesen gives example of how the ordeals were designed to make this easy priest were alone before and after the ordeal spectator couldn't be too close priest had to judge whether the person had passed or not etc so evidence to support lesen's view is historically most people who underwent ordeal passed data from 13th century hungary 130 out of uh, 200 208 passed see in england um, uh, between uh, 1194 to 1219 of 19 ordeal that is for whom outcome was recorded and 17 passed only two failed and this seems to have been by design that is other situation are the other historians the ordeals of hot iron was so arranged as to give the accused a considerable chance of escape ordeal of hot iron was so arranged as to give the accused escape others the average lean male has an 80% chance of sinking in water 
compared to only 40% chance of average lean woman. So, England, uh, between that uh, point, that is in uh, th uh, 1194 and 1208, 84 men went through ordeal, 79 were given cold water ordeal. And seven women went through ordeal, all were given hot time ordeal. So, now ordeals were only used on believers, as I said earlier. If the defendant was a Christian, he was tried by ordeal. If he was Jewish, he was tried by congregation instead, not ordeal. So, once church rejected the legitimacy of ordeals, they disappeared entirely. To conclude, though rooted in superstition, judicial ordeals were not irrational. Okay. And expecting to emerge from ordeals unscathed and exonerated, innocent persons found it cheaper to undergo ordeals than to de decline them. Okay. Expecting to emerge that is boiled, burned or went and naked and condemned, guilty person found it cheaper to decline ordeal than to undergo them. So priest knew that only innocent person would want to undergo ordeal, accelerate probands, whoever, whatever, whenever they would. And in medieval judicial ordeals achieved uh, what they saw that they, act, they accurately assign guilty and innocence where traditional means couldn't. So this is one way of understanding people, people's mind and uh, you know, assessing that whether their intention, whether they are done crime and based on their belief and how the punishment is going to be, uh, you know, uh, and designed and uh, uh, having its effect on. So, in US, most crimes punished by imprisonment. Now, let's talk about the modern so-called punishment system. In India also, you have uh, punishment which is with the imprisonment. Okay. And in US and in Europe, uh, the imprisonment is a longer period. So, US most crime punished by longer imprisonment, double, triple imprisonment, which we have passively referred in the last lecture. So, imprisonment has several effects. A. Deterrence. B. Punishment. C. Opportunity for rehabilitation. D. Incapacitation. Alright. So, when is incapacitation effective? So, you have four possible, you know, effect out of punishment. One is you are deterring, the other one is you are punishing the person. Then, you are trying to correct the person and uh, you are also incapacitating the person. Now, when supply of criminals is inelastic that is when there is not someone else waiting to take criminal's place then incapacitation is a very effective way that is one of the objective of this thing then crime would be reduced and when it changes number of crimes a person will commit rather than just delaying them so, there are other kind of uh, punishment also uh, there. So, we have already seen deterrence effect. So, the deterrence effect is that, you know, you are uh, by uh, severity of the punishment, uh, people, uh, the possibility of people's or uh, the interest of people will fall in committing such crimes. For example, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, horror in the crime, for example, uh, if you watch uh, the lethal uh, punishment like uh, a capital punishment, 
So the mentality of the criminal itself is terrible, horrific. So the, the that horror is actually makes people uh, deterred from committing a crime. Again, in many places, you know, stoning to death, so many very harsh uh, exhibition of punishment, public hanging, condemning, etc., are so harsh, which makes, uh, which uh, basically play with the people's mind and um, their behavior, which in fact uh, kind of uh, act as a deterrent of uh, crimes. Again, uh, the same is actually if you still commit, then you have to actually uh, undergo a certain period, okay, or certain level of, uh, you know, harassment or whatever, punishment. So that is itself the person personal point of view. Now the third one is uh, the opportunity for rehabilitation is that, you know, you maybe by mistake or by knowing and all but still it gives you imprisonment gives you a possibility possibility to correct yourself that is you can also um, change your mind and uh, do good and at the same time the last one is interesting that is you know the crime criminal is also already in the prison so the probability of commitment has come Fines are efficient, no social cost but a greater threat of abuse since state makes money. Freedmen, as we have pointed in the earlier lecture, are in a world of efficient punishment, somebody gets most of what are convicted defendant lose. So it is in that somebody's interest to convict defendant where or not they are guilty is the point. So other punishment tend to be inefficient, that is direct cost of holding someone in maximum security prison estimated at say $14,000 per year. In some state prisoners do useful work, Attica state prison had a metal shop, Minnesota firm employs inmates as computer programmers, medium security prisons in Illinois make marching band uniform. And in Kerala, uh, in India particularly, the prison comes with a lot of uh, uh, innovative things. For example, in, in jail, you have uh, the jail chapati is very famous in Kerala. And they were using now in, during this pandemic, this uh, jail where this jail inmates uh, they wear uh, or they are making a uh, mask in a larger scale then so many useful things they are uh, uh, doing by uh, the, uh, the prisoners are doing so, so in that sense you are trying to actually uh, productively using uh, the inmates all right, so uh, these are one description of what we see. Okay. So discretion in sentencing, therefore, uh, is a way another uh, interesting uh, that is move from judicial discretion to mandatory sentencing. Mm, what we do is actually is situated. so so let us go to this thing sorry yeah um, sorry for this thing so uh, discretion 
is what else we are going to discuss now so discretion is a kind of um, uh, uh, sentencing that is moves judicial discretion to mandatory sentencing that is most states under and federal courts sentence mostly pinned down by crime and offender system now that is some way this is all, almost practiced by uh, many places in the world so recent move in opposite direction that is ma and la recently brought back discretionary sentencing uh, must brought back a discretionary parole for non violent first time offenders various sentencing reforms in 18 other states in in india also you have different kinds of sentence uh, sentence uh, exemptions and kind of uh, uh, what you call the uh, judicial jail reforms and now also we have in recently last year in kerala you have a, a jail reform uh, a thing which is going on uh, so there are so many uh kind of interventions to even uh deal the prison okay and the prisoners all right so that is a separate uh, discussion point and we are not going to delve in that kind of uh, discussion so let us move to the effectiveness of fine because we have already said hinted that fine itself is a kind of punishment right so where in the western europe many crimes punished by fines that is textbook uh, cites a study from 1977 examining certain crimes that is 56% of selected defendant in england and wales 77% in germany were punished only by fines US federal court 5% of defendant punished to labor fines in india also you have a, even in criminal cases you have fines and uh, with a fine with imprisonment or imprisonment plus fine and a composite or only imprisonment and a, or a combination of both so in us criminal fines are in dollars in europe day fines that is punishment is equal to fixed number of days of sad so rich pay bigger fines than poor this is what is an european structure okay so should the rich pay bigger fines than the poor so this leaves this question because uh, some crimes have monetary benefit some have non monetary benefit that is the monetary benefit is stealing 100 dollar as same monetary benefit for rich or poor answer is different so penalty with the same money equivalent say 1000 dollar should have same deterrent effect we don't know so punching someone in the face in a bar might have some utility or benefit for a rich or poor person since rich have lower margin of utility of money it would take a larger fine to have same deterrent effect but with costly enforcement goal is not to deter all crimes some examples also very important in this regard that is optimal to deter most crimes by both rich and poor which requires higher fines for rich people uh that is optimal yeah not uh, bother deterring crimes by the rich so this is these two points are very important as far as the goals and enforcement is concerned again society may have other goals beside efficiency as we had already said you know, it is not the efficiency always matters as far as the social point is concerned that might play place that might place high value on low treating everyone the same even if we have this if we have to sacrifice some efficiency to achieve this so example choice of a fine or jail time tend to put low dollar value on time in jail might be sentenced for 5000 fine 
or a year in jail. So most people who can afford the fine will choose to pay. Those who can't will go to jail. <coughs> so rich pay a small, smallish fine. They can easily afford. And poor go to jail. Hit a worker ten thousand in forty years. John Law that is equal present terms uh, for rich or poor make sense. The rich value their time more than poor, but the rich have better lawyers, maybe less likely to be convicted. So that is also there. Now there is another uh, problem which is exists with the crime and punishment, which is stigma. That is stigma of having been convicted of a crime. That is, you are a corp corporate treasurer and get caught embezzling. So one consequence is you go to jail for a year. Another, when you get out, you can't get another job as a treasurer. So punishment is equal to jail time plus stigma. Stigma. As a punishment has negative social cost. No wage at which a firm would hire an embezzler as treasurer. So getting hired by that firm would be inefficient. But without the conviction, you might have gotten the job. So knowledge that you are an embezzler has value to society. A stigma as a punishment. Uh, very efficient when applied to guilty person. Very inefficient when applied to innocent person. That is uh, the suggestion is that the criminal cases where conviction carries a social stigma should have higher standard of proof than civil cases where it doesn't. So now comes to the other important aspect of the crime. Uh, uh, the punishment which is called the death penalty. So let us talk death penalty. In 1972, US Supreme Court found death penalty as it was being practiced unconstitutional. But still, the application was capricious and discriminatory. Okay. Several states uh, changed how it was being administered to comply. In 76, Supreme Court upheld some of the new laws. Since 76, uh, average of 41 executions per year in the United States, Texas and Oklahoma together count for half. Nationwide, 3,000 prisoners currently on death row. Since 1976, 304 inmates on death row were exonerated, many more pardoned or had sentence commuted by governors. Now, in India, you have the same situation in one of the country where still let death penalty is legal. Most of the countries in the world, like 130 or 40 countries have now declared that death penalty is illegal. Okay, there is no death penalty. So very few countries and uh, interestingly the democratic country like India and the United States still practice death penalty okay, as a kind of tool to uh, punish the crime. Okay. In India you, you, you treat uh, death penalty only in the cases like you know, the clause with rarest of the rare case or culpable homicide and rarest of the rare. Otherwise, especially the terrorist act and many, many kind of every, uh, such act is being trade under this. Okay. So now the question is that whether death penalty deter, we don't know. But let's stop it. There is mixed result, that's what we said.
Now, once uh, one concern about death penalty in United States, we it's applied a serial basis. One study is a very important one, which is what we have uh, referring here. This says that there is a racial profiling exist even giving death penalty. Okay, that is uh, you have uh, this thing. Fraction of convicted murderers sentenced to death in one study says that. So you have a black defendant, white defendant, overall cases. white victims then black victims see in the overall cases that is uh, black defendant 7.9 were punished whereas white defendant overall 11% whereas white victim and a black defendant is white victim and a black defendant 22.9% has been sentenced whereas white victim and white defendant 11.3% a black defendant and a black victim 2.8% whereas a black victim and a white defendant nobody is punished that is given sentence So look at the black defendant and white victim. Twenty-two point nine percent cases are given the penalty, whereas a black victim and a white defendant only zero percent. So, what do you think? Interesting, right? So. With a white defendant, eleven percent. Only black defendant, seven point. This case, uh, the, the this shows that some sort of uh, a racial profiling is existing. In Indian context, also we could say this. This is not basically black and white. there are other possibility because so for example a uh, couple of years back uh, hindu and uh, many newspapers reported on the uh, you know sentencing or jail profile based on caste and religious uh, profile is so they say that actually uh, is this socially backward community or economically backward communities like acst obc and they are having higher uh, conviction rate than the other of our community similarly there is also religious profiling in that study so that means this is overall there is also profiling exist uh, in the crime or uh, in the criminal uh, the, the, the punishment of crime so uh, we have to actually look more details into this because we don't uh, categorically say that this is because of that so let's discuss Uh, let's have some study comes out with this with with, with uh, some substantial you know result then we can say that whether there is a profiling in this or not okay now victimless crime okay many crimes don't seem to directly harm anyone so can be all the for example when victim is already dead organ said victim is already you know, dead or whatever but in a world where cannibalism is legal the private benefit of murder is high might lead to more murderers same with organ sales once human organs become valuable to a, a tradable commodities value of killing someone become high 
so may make sense to outlaw certain practices that do not harm themselves but encourage the harms so this is what is actually the point of victimless crime and now let's come to the drug crimes so increasing expected punishment for dealing drugs will increase street price so this is what we know all the uh, kind of drugs which is so highly priced because it is illegal so what happens next depends on elasticity of demand it is casual user tend to have elastic demand if price goes up that is there is difficulty in obtaining drugs goes up demand drops a lot but addicts have very inelastic demand on the contrary and uh, price goes up but demand stay about the same so expenditure go up in kerala we know this right especially alcohol so even the uh, government had uh, taxed many times still the price the the, the 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 overall the gross uh, turnout is increasing because of many reasons this inelastic demand so drug addicts who support their habits through crime have to commit more crimes so ideal public policy be to raise price for non addicts without raising price for addicts <coughs> so what is that possible to do so these are the question which we are going to leave out now this is not an issue in india but in across the world this is going to be violent crimes here it has been treated as a terrorist act or kind of so violent crimes are gun ownership both high in us relative to europe and asia okay so yesterday day before even uh, uh, uh just day before in i think virginia somebody was shot that is uh, some a customer shot the guard who asked the customer to wear a mask because of the pandemic covid 19 so during the covid 19 uh, it is compulsory that everybody has to wear a mask so the guard insisted and the customer came out and argued with the guard and uh, shot him so that therefore the violent crimes with uh, guns are very high in united states but causation is unclear maybe more guns cause more crimes that may be one reason or maybe more crimes leads more people to want to own guns okay so us canada and britain have similar burglary rates in canada and britain about 50% of burglaries are hot that is occur when victim is at home in us so the 10 percent of burglaries are hot that is so gun ownership doesn't seem to change overall number of burglaries but does change the composition so now the last thing is about the profiling racial profile well well known that black drivers are more likely to be pulled over and searched than white drivers this is not an aberration in the united states this is recurring this is existing problem in in india especially in recent times the same racial profiling is in a different sense here religious profiling or you say that caste profiling exists very prevalently in india all right a recent uh, uh, newspaper report uh, says that uh, even in the riots okay even in the riots people are using racial profile uh, sorry the religious profile in the recent riot in delhi 
where they uh, took data uh, from internet i mean some source and they you know uh, they set, set fire or, or they destroyed vehicle of a particular community so these kind of things are already existing everywhere profiling so uh, in the united states for example january 1995 1999 uh, in maryland 18% of drivers were african american 63 of searches okay that is one explanation police hates uh, you know black people or i don't know different explanation is a race uh, could be correlated with other things that actually predict crime so maybe people in gold lex lexuses with a tinted uh, window and out of state plates are more likely to be carrying drugs so police stop more gold lexus with out of state plates more african americans drive gold lexus so how to tell this difference so we need more information about what drivers were stopped and searched so what do you what, what to do if you don't have data we have to find it. This is what is we have to do in that context. So if I make a claim that something is actually existing, then it is better to look into it and disprove that that doesn't exist or to prove that that exists. So in 2001, Journal of Political Economy, Game Theory, Moral of Police and Drivers, then uh, Police get positive payoff from catching criminals. Pay cost search time, they stop a driver. Driver gets some payoff from moving drugs. Pay cost if they get caught. Police may use lots of information, race plus their thing, to determine who to pull over, but we, this researcher, may not observe all that info. Suppose there is a certain set of attributes that is race plus other information that make it very likely someone has drug then police uh, will always search cars that fit those attributes so chance of being caught is very high for those drivers so drivers with those attributes will stop carrying drug only equilibrium is for each set of attributes some driver carry some don't for each set of attribute, police search some cars, don't search others. So these are the kind of thing and uh, there is a mixed strategy equilibrium that is police have to be different, uh, uh, indifferent between stopping and not stopping a given type of car driver. So if police see the cost as the same for all types, the payoff has to be the same too, which means that in equilibrium, if police are not racist the chance of finding drugs has to be the same for every car stopped which means if we average over other characteristics black drivers should have the same probability of being guilty when they are stopped as white drivers but this still might mean different search rates again prediction is that if police are not racist each race could have different rates of being stopped, searched, but should have some, should have same rate of being guilty when searched. Of drivers who were stopped in period they examined, 32% of white drivers were found to have drugs, 34% black drivers were found to have drugs. That is, they are mostly close enough. That is, 32% of white and 34% of black uh, drivers are uh, drivers were having drugs in the search so they are mostly close like only 2% difference but look at uh, the level of actually search which is conducted to, uh, between these two group normally you know it is uh, 
to be frank you know there is no again this is the same thing is actually uh, uh, the, the international a uh, national and international media about crime committed if some ex community commi- uh, commit a crime it never become a news and some ex community if uh commit then it becomes a huge matter of discussion so these kind of you know uh, constructions are largely social constructions to be very precise because if some do a murder for example there are in kerala you have a series of issues uh if some uh, commit murder then it never becomes a uh an issue if some other people commit murder then uh it becomes a huge who and cry in media so this kind of difference is always uh this is a very interesting way of looking at this is profiling so is there a profiling exists what is this basis this profiling um so uh, we need to really uh, talk about such profiling in the in the name of uh, community in the name of um, caste line in the name of race line etc so but only 11 now again uh, just to talk, uh, talk about the other part that is uh, 11% of hispanic drivers were found to have drugs and only 22% of white women so police seem to not be biased against black drivers but to be biased against hispanic and white women so if guilty defines as only hard drugs or only felony level quantities then police seems to be biased against white drivers so this is what is actually the united states evidence says and in india we don't have much data i mean much study on this so let's get some data and we will discuss that maybe one way of assignment or so to all the listeners so thank you for uh, listening this uh, part of lecture so with this i think we most almost uh, concluded the uh, lecture on crime and punishment and all this uh, uh, this lecture is basically uh based on a uh, couple of uh, reference uh, especially uh, the basic article is actually written by gary s becker himself uh, that is crime and punishment and the textbook which we referred is mostly cooter and rural and uh, specifically friedman uh laws or so i hope all of you enjoyed the lecture and let's uh uh stop the lecture and thank you uh, and have a nice day thank you